Will you all please be upstanding, please worship the mayor. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this full council, Wednesday, the 27th of September. Uh, please note that this meeting will be recorded for subsequent broadcast via the authorities' internet site. The images and sound recording may also be used for training purposes within the authority. The public seating areas will be in view of the camera, and by entering the chamber and using the public seating area, members of the public are consenting to being filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings as outlined above. Okay, if we go into the first item on the agenda, please. Any apologies for absence? Councillor John Thomas, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Mitten. Uh, Mr. Mayor, unfortunately, I have to leave the chamber tonight at six fifteen. Noted. Thank you. And agenda item number two, declarations of interest. Members are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and prejudicial interest in respect of matters contained in this agenda in accordance with the provisions of the Local Government and Finance Act 1992 relating to Council Tax, the Local Government Act 2000, the Council Constitution and the Members' Code of Conduct. Do we have any declarations? Declaration of interest, Mr. Mayor. Um, item 16, authorization of officers report. I work and own uh, a company in the industry and I will draw during the debate and vote. Yeah. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Um, on item 10 of the report, uh, representatives to other bodies, um, I'm chair of the UK and Ireland nuclear free local authorities and I'm led to believe that this matter is going to be discussed, so I will leave the meeting at that point. Thank you, Eddie. Anybody else? No? Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we got a special presentation for everybody today. We, uh, we got a, an overview of the Murphy Tidbill Borough Wide Youth Forum. So I'd like to introduce Lauren, Ryan, Caitlin, Josh, and Janet, who is going now going to give us a presentation. Thank you. So hello, Council. Um, it's lovely to be invited here, and thank you for having us. So I am Lauren Davis. I'm the Youth Mayor, and I am also the Chair of the Cabinet and Youth Forum. So now um, my rest of my colleagues are going to introduce themselves because they're quite capable of doing that themselves. <laughs> So uh, my name is Ryan. I've been a member of uh, the Merthyr Tidbill Borough Wide Youth Forum for uh, since about uh, May time. Uh, I'm Joshua, uh, and I've been a member for three years, I think. Uh, and uh, I am the media chair for the cabinet, so uh, I've been involved in production of uh, posters uh, and leaflets. My name is Jenna Noble and I am Deputy Youth Mayor of Merthyr. My name is Caitlin Sutton and I joined MT Boyth at the start of this year and I'm on Cabinet and recently joined Scrutiny. So first of all, to brief you on what MT Boyth is, if you haven't already heard of us, we are basically a, a group of young people aged 11 to 25 and Empty Boyce stands for Merthyr Tidville Borough Wide Youth Forum. So it is the platform for young people of Merthyr to basically approach ourselves and other key decision makers in policy. Um, it's also uh, a method for you guys and other key policy makers to get young people's viewpoints um, across and to find out basically whether you're doing your job right. <laughs> so it's a is extremely important to in order to ensure well-being and future of Merthyr. I think it's really good that you've chosen to recognise that and to recognise that young people is important by inviting us today. Um, but that's basically what we are, so we'll explain a little bit more detail as we go along. 
Okay, so what we've got is basically a structure of um, really how the Youth Forum works in a way. Um, the Youth Forum uh, take it basically has a represents a big cross section of young people in Merthyr that come from. You can see there we got people from schools, universities like myself, um, college and youth provisions, and like I said, um, it represents quite a broad range of backgrounds. So we got LGBT, Rainbow Forum, Gypsy Traveller, and uh, people from any other um, <coughs> ba different backgrounds. These people come along and they um, voice anything that affects them, which is then um, is then fed into the youth cabinet, which is made up of 60 members. I'm a member, and it's obviously headed by the youth mayor and the deputy youth mayor. The youth cabinet then feeds this information to um, different organisations on a local level and on a um, on a national level. So y you can see how there we've got scrutiny panels and audit, which are local um, institutions. And on a national level, we've got things like Public Health Wales, the Children of Wales panel. And in the future, I think 2018, um, we will be feeding to the Welsh Youth Parliament. Now, some of the consultations that um, Empty Boyf has been involved in um, include uh, the Welsh Youth Parliament, the kind of the conception of the Welsh Youth, pa um, youth Parliament, and uh, the Wellbeing and Future Generations uh, consultation. On a local level, we were involved in um, a consultation into decide where the new primary school in Kevin Coyd should be placed, and um, the new curriculum for primary schools, along with the uh, Minister of Education, Kirsty Williams. <coughs> At the heart of Empty Boyf is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's it's our biggest priority. It's our main role. We are all trained in participation, and we also provide training for for a lot of people. Basically, we've got down here. 37 of the Kafka staff received uh, our participation training. We got very positive feedback from that, and we are now part of their annual induction process. And I should make it clear that we are willing to give training to any councillors that may be interested. So I'm going to hog you a bit now because I'm going to talk about the Youth Mayor. Some of you already is, are familiar with the Youth Mayor initiative. So um, basically the role of the Youth Mayor almost mirrors the actual mayor. So we're the first youth citizen of Merthyr. We represent all people from 11 to 25. We also shadow the mayo of the mayo. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want some chips for that as well? <laughs> we also shadow the mayor on um, civic duties, um, for example, he invited me to his Civic Sunday, and I've seen a lot of you in different events also. So our, our main role is to basically promote the rights of young people, and that's basically based on the UNCRC. Um, is everybody familiar with the UNCRC? Is, does everybody know what it is? If not, please like have a chat to either Jan or Jamie, because we've got easy guides that sums everything up. Um, and then we also work with Youth Cabinet to make positive changes for young people. <coughs> so this comes in the form of our pledges. So um, you develop your pledge when you stand for Deputy Youth Mayor, because the way we work is that you first go for Deputy Youth Mayor, then you automatically go into Youth Mayor after two years. So you do a first year almost like a shadow of the Youth Mayor and do your own stuff. So then you learn how to be a mayor, and then you do your term of office as a Youth Mayor. So my pledges were, um, if I think back, <laughs> was um, to raise awareness of mental health, um, to also um, try to help social services in how they interact with um, people and young people, and also to raise awareness of homelessness. So um, whilst I was deputy youth mayor, I raised, um, I didn't want to raise money, but I raised like food and some necessities for um, homeless people and people living on the streets for donation station. So that's what I did then. And I also got invited um, on a social services interviewing panel for a post. So it's a good way for local businesses as well to get, if you're working with young people, 
to get um, a viewpoint on how to appoint people um, and how which one was best. Um, that was very lucky. That was really successful. So my main point that I focused on um, as my youth mayor is mental health awareness. Um, I am very passionate about building resilience of young people. Um, I don't th personally, I don't think the deal is medicine all the time. I think you can start earlier on and build resilience uh, to deal with just life stress, exam stress. And I know you think, oh, what is young people got to be stressed about? But you think about the basics back to when you were our age, like your body's changing, you've got different um, things going on in family. And then we've got also our own sort of things with school and work and everything else. Um, so that's what I'm passionate about. And we have been doing a project this year, but I'll, I'll leave with my colleagues to talk about that. Um, so we are also recently looking at um, changing um, the youth mayor post to fit in with the actual mayor. So this will mean that it will go from May to April instead of the current November to October. Um, we are currently working on a proposal to you guys and hopefully you'll say yes. And the reason why we want to do this is because one, it mirrors the actual mayor so people and young people get used to that calendar. And uh, secondly, it also makes sense because working with two mayors is sometimes a little bit hectic. I've been really lucky to work with the mayors that I have worked with, um, but it's a lot easier if we streamline it and build up a relationship. Um, it's a lot easier and nicer that way. So I'm not going to bore you anymore with that. <laughs> and uh, I'll pass you on. We have had some fantastic opportunities over the year. We have worked with the Mercer Council, Social Services, Wigball, Withal, um, British Youth Council, Public Health Wales, the Youth Mayor, High Sheriff, and we've also made some of our own films. Um, in, in scrutiny now, as you can see, these are all the people that are members. We also have Lois Morgan on audit. Um, with scrutiny, as you all know, it is the Merthyr Council that has asked to, well, I mean, youth um, council members get to be on with the youth, with the council members in Merthyr Tidville. Being on the scrutiny has been very interesting and eventful. I have only been to one meeting and I felt so welcomed and comfortable. I'm very happy to have had that opportunity. Wirval has, has offered us a variety of opportunities to get involved with. Some cabinet members, including me, took part in a residential in the year centre in Cardiff Bay, where we met Wirval partners from all over Wales. The project must be run by young people and young people must complete the application form. The panel of young people decide what project meets the criteria and how they will award the funding. Last year we awarded funding the Last year, we awarded the funding to Kavatha High School, Eco Project, and Drug Aid. It is really exciting when we get to award them the actual check. As a member of the youth forum, we are able to sign up as Millennium Volunteers. Empty Boyce, the up and coming project of Merthyr Tidville to Win Club Volunteers, were invited to speak with the WCVA President Actor Michael Sheen about volunteering experiences. He was very interested in what we had to say and he was a very lovely person. It was such a fantastic opportunity, he was amazing. And then to top it all off, he presented us with 50 hours, 100 hours, and for Morgan Alice, a 200 hour volunteer award. Uh, so as a forum, we work uh, closely with uh, children in Wales and uh, through this, we. We uh, had the opportunity to work with Public Health Wales too. Uh, initially, we were uh, asked to help them produce a young people's version of their uh, annual quality statement, uh, which is seen on the slide here. Uh, we were then invited to the launch in Haverford West at the AGM, where uh, Ashley Davis, a member of the forum, uh, gave a speech about the importance of young people being involved with this task. Uh, as a result, the young people we have been working with from Monmouth, Cardiff and Wrexham are planning a Young People's Health Summit 
Uh, this will take place on the 4th of November at the Angel Hotel in Cardiff, and uh, the Youth Cabinet will be deliver delivering two of the four workshops taking place on the day, uh, with, which will be mental health and sexual health. Make Your Mark is the name of the campaign that our Member of Youth Parliament links to, which this year, James Good, will be going to Youth Parliament in November. The Make Your Mark campaign is about young people having a democratic vote to decide what is the most important issue for them. The top five issues are debated in the House of Commons in December. The debate is on a live feed for anyone to watch. The last year of top issues was votes at 16, which is currently being presented to the Council. This year we have two schools which are signed up, which are Aventaf and Kafafa High School. The votes are being counted this, week's, this week and tallies will be sent to the British Youth Council. When we have the result, we will inform you, as it's important you understand what are the top issues that affect young people. The Youth Mayor and the Deputy Youth Mayor have the role as ambassadors for the High Sheriff Awards. Their role is to promote awareness, uh, uh, promote the awards in the borough and to attend pre-meetings to the event. They also are invited to the awards. The event is all about young people and their achievements. Last year, the Explorer Scouts in Merthyr won the overall award. The reward was £1,000. The High Sheriff Awards showcase achievement of young people. So as a, a youth cabinet, uh, we have supported the youth mayor in her pledge uh, to raise the profile about positive mental health. Uh, in January of 2017, we informed the uh, MT Boyf members that we will be starting a film project about positive mental health, and anyone interested was welcome to take part. Uh, the project has grown considerably since then, and we have linked up with the Up and Coming project, uh, and as a result, have not only produced a DVD, uh, but also a toolkit to, to accompany this. We, we have linked with the Comtaf Health Board to ensure that the toolkit is fit for purpose, and we are now in the final stages of uh, putting the project all together. Uh, and the launch of the DVD and the toolkit will be Wednesday the 25th of October uh, at the Red House in Merth Tidville. And film, the film and toolkit has already been requested to be utilised at the at the Merthyr School Conference and also at the All Wales Public Health Summit in Cardiff on the 4th of November 2017. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the training. I was talking about the training earlier. <coughs> um, we, the MT Boy, have been involved in training basically all through the summer. Three examples of that, uh, disability awareness training, uh, public speaking training, this is paying off, and <laughs> And the train and the train the trainers training, which um, incorporates the the UNCRC and the participation standards that I also spoke about earlier. Uh, we find this very important because this it develops our skills and it develops our knowledge to become active and aware citizens within our community. And um, the young people say training and participation, which we are now trained to deliver. Um, is extremely important, not just to us, but also to adults and counsellors, because, well, just like I said, it's the UNCRC, which is at the heart of what we do, and I'll say it again, we are offering this training to the counsellors. So... Thank you for listening to us. If you want to get in touch with the Youth Forum, if you want a place of visit, we uh, finish, oh, sorry, I can't speak today, a visit, um, anybody is welcome. Um, if you want to come in, just sit in and see exactly what we do. If you want to be hot seated, this is something that our young people are very interested in, if one of you is willing and brave enough, <laughs> um, then that would also be really, really good because um, you wouldn't think it, but young people are taking more and more interest in politics, especially local politics, and uh, especially Mirtha, well, Mirtha Rising Festival, should I tell you that, like, that was really good. Um, but just to, like, emphasize about, like, why Empty Boyf is important and 
um, to you guys. And like we 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 were lucky that we had the buy-in from the last council, and they were quite passionate about it. But I was speaking to I was spoken to a few of you, and you are still really passionate. But it is the platform for you guys to basically get in touch with us. It's the easiest ways to get in touch with young people um, and get your viewpoints across, try to get young people more involved. And it's not only that, it, you're building the future of Merthyr by engaging with us. Um, future generations is really important, especially in regeneration of Merthyr and trying to revamp. Um, so like, can we work together in building Merthyr? Because like, the, the actions of today um, defines what happens tomorrow. So please buy into us. And again, training. We've done Young People Say training for past um, council members and they really, really enjoyed it and they had very good feedback. Um, so we have done it before and we that is our own developed training. Um, previously, other cabinets have developed it and we now deliver it. Um, we've also got a launch of our mental health project on the 25th of October. Um, Please come along if you if you're interested. Um, it would be if I'd love to have you all there, and of course everybody else would. So yeah, I'm not going to bore you anymore. If you've got any more questions, <coughs> come to a meeting. Um, that's the best one to really say. We normally have chicken goujons, plenty to go around. Um, but yeah, we we really really like for to like come and see you a little bit more. This is good. This is really promising. So I'm just excited to see where this relationship will take us with the new council. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren and the guys. I think it was a, a fanta fantastic presentation. And, and, uh, and I think as you gather, there may be training available for councillors at some <laughs> point. <laughs> um, I know the, the leader would like to say a few words now. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you very much. That was very impressive and very reassuring. I'm sure I speak for everybody in the room here to say how impressed we are with the whole structure. There's one thing you're missing, is a strong line between us and you. And next time you do that schematic, I hope that, that strong line will be there. I know f at least, Gareth, since 2009, there's a police officer this has been going. So and it's always been a, um, um, a groundbreaker for Merthyr Tydfil. No one else seems to push it, and particularly now you've got a cabinet structure. We met, I met Michael, Michael Sheen as well, and he wanted to make a film about me. It's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> about my last couple of weeks. But um, yeah, and I was there to see uh, people getting awards, and it was, it was, it was very, uh, very impressive. Um, I've also sat in scrutiny. I've sat in all the scrutiny meetings and I've seen you operating. And I'm sure you've got our councillors on the toes a little bit because you, you certainly read the papers beha beforehand and you certainly think about your questions and that was very impressive as well. Um, uh, we want to have a, a relationship that's much more robust, that's much more structured and that's why I've spoken to you about our, your cabinet meeting our cabinet. And we need your views. We demand your views because if we are planning the future, it's your future. Yeah, so even as old guys you want to listen to what you say, and I volunteer for the first hot seat. I'll sit in that hot seat. I mean, one in Tesco's tomorrow, <laughs> but I'll sit in you as next. So uh, again, thank you very much. It's been uh, inspiring, and good luck for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was very impressed with your presentation, but even more impressed with the fact that uh, you're going to get involved with the mental health project. And um, it's a known fact that one in four of the population will suffer mental ill health in the United Kingdom. And that just doesn't relate to older people. It will affect younger people and as the vice chairman of the Murtha um, Valleys mine branch I am really pleased that you're looking at that particular matter. Thank you. Councillor Rogers. Thank you Mr Mayor regarding um, my congr congratulations to the panel and a uh, lot of enthusiasm which I admire in people but I would like to make a comment and um, just a comment you, you can make a note it is the um, we have gone back on our youth service in the county borough we didn't produce like we were so I'm concerned about the people coming through that's what concerns me really as I know throughout the borough people are contacting me as ex 
youth leader of well over 35 years. So can we also make a note of that? Not you people, but can we as a, as a council make note of it and look at look into that first opportunity we got? Because what I've been told, if, you, if I'm wrong, please correct me, but I know that we've lost a lot of youth services in the county borough and we're not going to reduce these people if we haven't got a youth service. Okay, is there any further comments? And thank you very much, uh, you you forum. Thank you. And if we can, we can have a given musical chairs now, so we can have our officers back. <laughs> I just one thing I've forgotten to mention. I'd like to thank, thank Chris, Councillor Chris Davis for organising the visit today. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Um, if we move on to now ag item number four on the agenda, it's a notice of motion, vote to 16 on pages one up to two. Um, Chris Davis is taking this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in proposing this motion, I'd like to thank the young people for obviously very inspiring and informative presentation. I've been delighted that they've been able to come here today as children's champion and also come into the Mayor's Parlour. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for hosting that prayer to this. I'd like to thank the staff here from Earth Tidville, who were really inspirational. Also our officers in the youth service. Um, we have received recent accommodation um, in uh, a Welsh Government monitoring visit of how excellent work are we doing here in, in Merthyr. Um, in terms of the uh, report, members, obviously you'll see uh, what we're asking you to, to do. I was pleased and proud to be asked by representatives of the Borough Wide Youth Forum, particularly Ashley Davis for the Youth Parliament, to bring this item forward to you tonight. You can see, obviously, on pages one, um, what we're asking you to note. Um, obviously, what comes today is are asking uh, you to, to believe in, in terms of how passionate and knowledgeable and capable our young people are in terms of engaging in a democratic system. Um, I do note the Welsh Government currently out of consultation on this. Um, over on to page two, um, members will, will see what we, um, we're asking you to resolve to support this evening in terms of joining the Voter 16 Coalition, to support in the Borough Wide Youth Forum in its Voter 16 um, campaign and the activities um, through what we do as a local authority in our corporate communication channels. Um, I know that the Head Democratic Services has been working really hard in terms of preparing the response uh, on behalf of the council to the Welsh Government's consultation and just to endorse um, and instruct in our support um, for that as part of the, the council's response. And obviously to ask the leader um, and the chief executive right to um, our MP, our assembly member and the regional assembly members to canvass their support. And uh, with that, Mr. Mayor, I propose um, the council supports the vote to 16 notice of motion. And just to say Diochen and Dayaun to um, the Youth Forum, and I'm looking forward to uh, working with them over the coming years. Thank you very much. I'd like to second that motion, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, thank you David. Um, do you have any questions? Councillor Amos? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, is there any question, really, if, if for Chris, is, um, I'm not sure we'd have the answer, actually, but have you got an idea what the participation rate is with the 18 to 19-year-olds uh, uh, currently, uh, Chris? I've not looked specifically at those figures because all the stuff that's coming out of um, the 
uh, work that's being done by the British Council and obviously by the Youth Parliament is focused on 16 to 17 year olds. I'm sure there is probably data and probably Jan and Jamie could get us for us, Julian, but I've, I'm 16 and 17 is where I've kind of focused and that's what the campaign has been around really. Any other questions? <coughs> Any comments then, please? Councillor Chris Butt. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, the Labour Group is fully supportive of this notice of motion. I, I, I think this will be unanimous to this council, to be honest. But young people of 16 are able to contribute to so many aspects of society that it's only right that they should also contribute to the selection of their representatives. You know, as we said earlier, we make making decisions that directly affect them. So we will be supporting this notice of motion. Thank you. Any further comments? No? And can we put that to the vote then, please? Brilliant. That, that vote's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, we move on to the next item on the agenda. It's the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, to approve as accurate the minutes of the following meetings, with this is 5A through to an inclusive 5P. Um, Leader, please. I move for accuracy of these minutes. I second. Thank you. Comment. Any comments? No? And can we put that to the vote then, please? Lovely, that vote's unanimous. Moving on to the committee reports, uh, we're on to agenda item number six. This is a statement of accounts 2016 to 2017 to consider the report of the Chief Executive, uh, uh, Councillor Andrew Barry. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, statement of accounts 2016-17 to present uh, for approval by Council the final order and statement of accounts for 16-17. We'll come back to the recommendations. We have a 3.1 to 3.5 the introduction and background to be noted at 3.1, the fact that the accounts have been completed two weeks earlier than usual. And thanks to Steve Adele and the team and accounts for doing that, the relevance of it is by 2020 uh, we'll be required to uh, com sorry, complete the, the accounts by the 31st of May and July, respectively. Um, at 3.2, the final order of accounts uh, were due, are due sorry, were prior to the 30th of September. The order of accounts have been to the audit committee on the 18th of September. Uh, in accompanying the, the final audited statement of accounts, this report is an executive summary of the final performance of the council during the financial year ending the 31st of March. You'll see uh, the international financial reporting standards of four, uh, at five, changes to the 2016-17 Statement of Accounts and Accounting Policies. Um, the final uh, audited Statement of Accounts. The Statement of Accounts has been ordered over the last three months by the external auditor, the Wales Audit Office. Um, the Audit Committee of the 18th September, in respect of the findings, uh, recommend, uh, sorry, the audit identified no uh, amendments to either the provisionally reported revenue or capital outturn. We have at uh, 8.1 the revenue outturn. These figures have been reported and talked of several times before. 8.1.2 uh, uh, talks of the surplus position. The significant movements can be found at 8.1.3. We have the capital outturn at 8.2. Again, figures that we should all be aware of by now. Um, 8.2.1 identifies that not all the planned capital funding was utilised, but no funding was lost. 
the financial position is at 83 in terms of our re general reserves, equating to 4%. Uh, the recommendation being that we should be between 3.5% and 4%, uh, ensuring that the Council continues to remain financially viable. We have with us today Helen Goddard, who's our external auditor. Uh, and before I move to the recommendations, I believe Helen wants to say a few words. Thank you. <laughs> Evening all. Um, within your packs today is our audit of financial statements report, which sets out for your consideration the matters arising from our audit work this year. The quality of the financial statement is much improved on prior years, and this is reflected within our report. Misstatements and additional disclosures required for compliance with the local government code were noted and have been amended within the final accounts presented to you today, with the exception of two misstatements which remain uncorrected. The audit committee agreed with management's decision to not correct for these, given their immaterial nature to the accounts as a whole and, to Im and the no impact on the results for the council for the year. The Auditor General will certify an unqualified opinion tomorrow subject to your approval of the accounts today. Um, so that's all I wanted to say and ask us any further questions on the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, it just remains for me to take us to 2.1, the recommendations. The audited statement of accounts for 2016-17, <laughs> uh, being the financial year ending 31st of March 2017, be approved. I move. Second. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have any questions? Any comments? Councillor Barry. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And Ms Mayor, I'd like to join uh, Councillor Barry, the other Councillor Barry Jr. in, <laughs> <laughs> in part of our thanks and congratulations on to Steve Adele and the whole team. We probably become a bit blase because they do this superb job year in, year out, and it gets harder and harder as the timelines get tighter and tighter. But you know, we, we really need to thank you. And I think let's get political for, for once tonight. I also want to pass our thanks on to the previous administration, especially the leading cabinet, for working with the staff and delivering such a healthy surplus despite a minor settlement and unprecedented financial uh, pressures. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Barry. Any any other comments? <laughs> <laughs> Senior. <laughs> any other comments? No. Um, we put this to the vote then, please. Nope. Thank you. That, vo that vote's unanimous. Helen, would you, would you like to go? So the next item on the agenda is number seven, a letter of representation 2016 to 2017 to consider the report of the chief executive on pages 83 to 88. And I understand uh, Councillor Barry Jr. has taken this one again. <laughs> I don't know if I like this junior, but uh, yeah, simply the letter of representation 2016-17. It's presented uh, for approval by the Council of Representations regarding two th uh, 2016-17 financial statement. I will see in the introduction and background 3.1 to 3.4. It's simply to make representations regarding the financial statement to the appointed auditor. Uh, and in 3.2, you'll see that the, the financial statement present a true and fair view of the, the financial position of the authority. Um, you'll see it for the financial implications. Uh, all financial implications uh, and obligations relating to this letter of representation are included within the Statement of Accounts 2016-17. Just remains for 2.1, the recommendations. Representations regarding 2016-17 financial statements be approved and communicated to the appointed auditor. I move. I second. Thank you. And do we have any questions? No questions? Uh, any comments? No comments? And can we put that to the vote then, please?
has been carried unanimously. Thank you. And we're on to agenda item number eight. It's the annual governance statement for financial year 2016-17 to consider report of the chief executive on pages 89 to 92. Councillor Andrew Barry again. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, the annual governance statement for financial year 2016-17 uh, simply to receive uh, and approve the annual governance statement 3.1 to 3.4 um, the accounts uh, and the audit wheels regulations 2014 require that the council annually uh, approve a statement on the internal control uh, each financial year uh, it accompanies the audited statement of accounts uh, annual governance statement the annual governance statement with the statement of accounts is instead of the, the the statement of internal control and is regarded now as best practice in Wales. Um, the annual governance statement has been presented uh, to corporate management team, uh, the governance, performance, business change and corporate services scrutiny committee, the audit committee, the leader of the council and the chief executive and external audit. Quite a comprehensive sort of list there. Um, 4.1 to 4.5, the format of the annual governance statement uh, covers the, the, the corporate systems and what it's designed to do, covering policies, services, values, ethical standards, laws, regulations, processes, statements, and are accurate and reliable, and the resources are managed efficiently and effectively. The annual governance statement is signed by the chief exec and the leader, uh, the leading member, uh, the, the mayor in this case. Um, the annual governance statement for 2016-17 was considered by the audit committee on the 18th. Uh, sorry, considered by the audit committee on the 18th of September. Uh, audit committee recommended to council that the annual governance statement 2016-17 be approved. In terms of financial implications, there are none specifically identified within this report. Although good corporate governance supports sound financial management and helps maximise financial resources minimize losses just take back then to the um, recommendations at 2.1 the annual governance statement 2016-17 be approved i move mr mayor i second thank you do you have any questions no questions any comments no um can we put that to the vote then please Thank you very much. That votes carried unanimously. And <coughs> if we move on to agenda item number nine, it's appointment to committees 2017 to 2018 to consider the report of the chief executive, and I'll be on pages 93 to 102. Um, leader, take this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A summary of the report talks about providing an update on the appointments to committees made by political leaders following a resolution to approve delegated authority at full council on 28th of June this year. As a result of receiving several resignations from committees by members, there is now need to fill the vacancies and ensure the correct political balance and good governance. I move the recommendation that the vacancy highlighted within the report be filled as a matter of urgency by the Leader of the Council and the Leader of the Opposition, and in any event, by the 30th of September at the latest. I second it. Thank you very much. And do we have any questions? No questions? Any comments? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Mayor, basically you just want three names off ourselves for the Appeals Committee, and I'm happy to give those now if we want them. Yeah, yeah. Council Councillor Clive Jones, Councillor David Isaacs, and Councillor Gas Richards. Thank you, Councillor Barry. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, if you could take that one to a vote, then, please. Thank you, that votes unanimous and carried. Um, the next item on the agenda is agenda item number 10, 
representatives to other representatives to other bodies 2017 2018 to consider the report of the chief executive and this is on pages 103 to 112 and the leader has taken this from the government thank you mr mayor uh, the summary of the report talks about providing an update on the nominations to outside bodies made by the political leaders following a resolution to approve delegated authority at full council on 20th of june 2017 Point one two, to seek a council decision on whether the council wishes to continue with its membership of the nuclear free councils. This is the only organization, save from WLGA and LJ, that the council pays a subscription to, and no determination whatsoever has ever been undertaken as to what value, if any, membership of this organization provides to the council. Point one three says, to note that a review is to take place on the number of champions and the champion roles to determine whether there is any overlap or duplication and to report back to the Council upon the conclusion of the review. The recommendations of 2.0 go as follows. 2.1, the contents of this report be noted. 2.2, the vacancies that have been identified be filled as a matter of urgency. 2.3, Council instructions are required as to whether Council continues its membership of the Nuclear Free Council's organisation. I move that Councillor Ernie Galsworthy remain as our nominated representative of the Nuclear Free Council until the AGM next year in 2018. At this juncture, all sufficient evidence will be available and research will be completed on membership of all other bodies and the notification of champions. And we'll be able to make a more informed decision then. I move. I second that, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, 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 there is a question. Obviously, AGM may actually be out of kilter in regards to the annual subscription to the uh, organisation. So, can I suggest it's until the subscription expires, and then we review it at that time? Uh, clearly, leader. The other, the other issue is is in regards to the um, the trust. Uh, clearly, we've currently got a vacancy on the trust. There's an indication in the trust nomination that Councillor Geraint <coughs> Thomas is the one representative. Obviously, the cabinet member uh, for governance had to stand down because of the conflict of interest in regards to this authority. Uh, but we do need to endeavour to fill that as a matter of urgency. The notes in your pack is a guidance uh, that we did suggest that it should be the cabinet members. Uh, but clearly, we've got one cabinet member on there. We do need another member. Uh, on that uh, on that organisation to represent this authority's view on the trust. Uh, thank you, Chief Executive. Just to clarify that, we will have a nomination for you, and as part of the recommendations, those other posts will be filled as a matter of urgency. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments? Councillor Barry. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank the leader and the group and, and the other groups we've spoken to for going forward with the nuclear free councils. Um, I do think we need to evaluate membership of all outside bodies as well, because looking at it, we, we, we've got 37 outside bodies we've represented on. Some of them have got multiple members sitting on them. Um, so what, what I'm thinking is just because a body represents invites us to have representation on it doesn't mean we automatically have to do it so I, I think this is definitely an exercise that we need to to undertake to see what we need to sit on and what can go inside because if you just look at these two reports we've got trouble filling a lot of vacancies at the moment why put pressure on ourselves where we don't have to thank you councillor Barry. councillor amos Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it was about the Tracati Liaison Committee, which is obviously uh, relating to my ward. Uh, it does say that the nominations there are listed alphabetically. Um, do we have to give the actual nominations, uh, you know, the, the substitutes and so on now, or can we can the four board, board members decide it later? 
Mr. Mayor, I think uh, what's being suggested again is, if you recall, we had a delegated authority in the last meeting that the leader and I have delegated power to uh, accept nominations to these uh, these bodies. And I think if we continue in that vein, so uh, if the elected representatives make uh, a decision in regards to who should sit where, then obviously we can take that forward. Uh, and picking up Councillor Barry's point, obviously if we're reviewing the champions, we will review the outside bodies uh, in regards to what our uh, commitment needs to be to those organisations. And I understand the piece of work is already going on yeah, in regards to that in any event. Leader? Yeah, um, just to say there's been a considerable amount of work on this, particularly in relation to the service it delivers, but also the value for money that's we're looking for. And um, uh, I, I echo uh, Councillor Barry's comments there in relation to, but uh, I would also like to recognise democratic services and the work that they've been doing in trying to harness this together. It's not a, an easy task and we all want to give as much as we can. So uh, the work is in progress, it's almost completed and uh, I'm sure myself and the, the Chief Executive can work through together. Any further comments? I'll put that to the vote then please. Thank you, that vote's unanimous. Um, the next item on the agenda is item number 11. It's the annual, oh, have you gone for any? Okay, so uh, we're looking at item number 11 on the agenda. It's the annual performance report 2016-2017 to consider the report of the Chief Executive and that's on pages 113 to 142. Um, leader, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Summary of the report as follows. The overall delivery of our corporate priorities is adequate where strengths outweigh areas for improvement is adequate because six of the seven corporate priorities require report adequate judgments with one reporting good outcomes. The latest annual improvement report from Merthyr Tydfil incorporates the corporate assessment and was issued in July 2017. The report concluded that during 2016 to 17, the council is meeting a statutory requirement in relation to continuous improvement. I would like to recognize the work of Ewan McWilliams and his team in this, if I can say it properly. And uh, also I'd further like to then move the recommendation that the annual performance report be approved. Do we have a seconder? I second that, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mr. Do we have any questions? Any comments? No? Uh, and can we put that one to the vote, please? That's carried unanimously, thank you very much. Item number 12 on the agenda is public engagement on the opening and locking of cemeteries within the county borough of Merthyr Tydfil to consider the report of the Deputy Chief Executive. And that's on pages 143 to 146. Councillor Andrew Barry. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Uh, the report is of the public engagement on the opening and locking of the cemetery gates, uh, sorry, the cemeteries within the County Borough of Merthyrville. Uh, the report is to seek approval to undertake a public engagement uh, regarding the reintroduction of locking the cemetery vehicular gates. Uh, the introduction and background, you'll see at 3.1 to 3.10.1. Um, in December 2013, the full council, 26th of February 14, uh, the vote went, um, resulted in a £75,000 saving to the council. Uh, at this time, the action of leaving the gates open resulted in an improved service to the public. And no consultation was required at that time. Uh, in the four subsequent years of the gates being unlocked, there's been no reports to the police or complaints to the authority of any antisocial behaviour. There are, however, anecdotal uh, re reports, and I, I welcome the, the reports from the local ward councillors in Pant, 
who've initialized this. Um, the uh, reintroduction of locking of ear drill gates would constitute uh, a detrimental position to the service user in this, uh, and therefore resulting public engagement is required. Uh, there, between 3.7 uh, <coughs> and 3.7.3, we have some lawful uh, precedent there uh, being introduced to the report. Um, in this case, uh, given that the detriment to the service user uh, and a risk of challenge, then there is a legitimate expectation to formally consult. Uh, whilst this issue has been raised in the Dowless Ward, it is a county borough wide concern uh, due to the nature of the service. And there's quite some uh, talk on social media from throughout the borough now. Uh, the financial implications of this consultation. There aren't any at present because it's just the consultation. If I take you back to the recommendations then, uh, 2.1, a county borough wide listening and engagement exercise followed by a public consultation to uh, be approved and the subsequent findings be brought back to council in a further report. I move the report, Mr. Mayor. I second that report. Thank you. Do do we have any questions? Councillor Barry. Yeah, just for clarity, uh, Mr Mayor, what's the difference in timescales between the two types of engagement? You've got the listening engagement or, or the immediate consultation. It tells us the consultation is four weeks. What's the time period for, for the sorry, listening engagement model? Uh, as so, uh, we'll do it as soon as possible. We'll just make sure that we engage with all the communities so it could take... Um, one week it could take four weeks. So there's no given time scale. It's just make sure that we've we've given um, every opportunity to everyone across the county borough. You'll have to excuse me. I'm probably it's, it's been a long day. So, so with the listening engagement, after that there is not a formal consultation. That that is the full consultation, or the, it's a consultation afterwards. As you'll see, because this is an, um, um, a very complex issue, that we would only take four weeks, where sometimes other consultations take 12. Just also pick some points up here. I think uh, we've just recently gone through a listening, engagements, uh, consulta uh, listening engagement and consultation in regards to uh, a matter that will be coming to council uh, hopefully next month. Uh, the issue is we need to listen uh, uh, and engage with the public on the basis that uh, we don't have any fixed views at the moment in regards to what can be done. Uh, so therefore, we need to go out to the public and uh, ask, actually ask what their views are. You know, we've, we've obviously got some uh, views uh, because obviously the local members are, are raising those, but there may be solutions which the public come back with as well. So, and uh, coupled with the fact that we have to do it county borough wide, there are five cemeteries that stand in the county borough. So we will have to engage with those communities as well, given... Uh, you know, given it will affect uh, each of those cemeteries. So whilst Kerry says it could be a week, uh, you know, the normal procedure is, is that we will uh, set up a public meeting of some kind where we will listen and engage. And again, we'll consult with the local members in regards to where the best place is for that to take place. Uh, we then have to evaluate what comes back, bring that to you, uh, and then you may have a preferred option to go out to the public with or a series of options to go back out to the public with for formal consultation. Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mr Mayor. It's just a question, actually. Uh, I'll be moving an amendment to this uh, report. Uh, I'd like some clarification from Caris. Do I move it now, or if not, at what stage do I move it? It's a matter for you, Councillor Amos, but you could move it now because um, at any point in the debate where you feel it's appropriate for you to say what you want to say, you can go ahead and say it. So, um, yes, if you're ready to move your amendment now, do it now. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Well, I'll move it now then. Uh, my amendment is that we delete the existing paragraph 310 in its entirety and we add a new paragraph to read... Council recognises that law-abiding daylight visitors to the cemeteries will not suffer detriment as a result of the proposal, and therefore consultation with the public is unnecessary 
Council of Strat's office has to take the necessary steps of locking the gates of all cemetery gates in the county by that forthwith. Um, I'd like to thank the Leader of the Council and the Independent Administration for bringing this matter to full Council. I have to say that that's where my gratitude ends. Uh, I say so because until a few weeks ago, I was expecting a far more positive report than this. And what I mean is that for the people of uh, Councillor Rogers and I represent in Douglas and Plant, we were expecting a report that would set out details of when the local authority could commence once again locking the vehicle gates of Plant Cemetery. Obviously, Plant Cemetery is uh, the cemetery that we are most concerned with. The vehicular gates were made secure for many years until February 2014, when the local authority began leaving them open all hours of the day and night. Since, since then, there have been a number of intrusions by individuals driving cars, leaving the, the hours of darkness for purposes one can only hazard a guess at. Talk of headlights being seen in the early hours of the morning, fly tipping, theft, theft of grave ornaments and damages have been, made, uh, have been made amongst the community. Apparently, individuals even go hunting rabbits up there. The report plays down the concern of residents using as a base the lack of formal complaints that have been made. The report makes no mention of a petition handed to former Dallas and Plant Councillor Phil Williams containing between 200 and 300 names asking for the gates to be shut. Turning to the recommendations to consult, the rationale used is that one is needed as the community will suffer detriment because at the moment they have unfettered, unfettered access to the cemetery whereas with a the closure they will not. This will not be the case if the gates are open between 9 a.m. in the morning and 5 p.m. in the winter when it gets dark, and 9 a.m. in the morning and 8 p.m. In, in the summer when it is still light. And that provides sufficient non-detrimental use for legitimate users of the cemetery who only go there to attend the graves of their loved ones. Only those bent on visiting the cemetery for illegitimate reasons under cover of darkness will suffer any detriment. For these reasons, any consultation aimed at eliciting a response from them is pointless. Indeed, when Councillor Rogers and I uh, reported back to the community the intention to consult, we were laughed at. Incidentally, no, no consultation was taken before the decision to leave the gates open was made. Although clearly legitimate visitors to the cemetery suffered a detriment where there wasn't one previously, individuals gained access for unknown purposes. The case of Morris v Newport City Council mentioned in the report relates to a change in policy by Newport County Council, City Council reducing the age of taxis in their licensing po policy. They did not undertake proper consultation and the report ruled against them. Clearly illegitimate taxi, driver, legitimate taxi drivers of old taxis suffered detriment. These drivers were going about legitimate business and not engaging in illegitimate business like visiting cemeteries after dark. I submit to Council, therefore, that any form of consultation aimed at people in criminal activity is unnecessary, and I would like to move my amendment. Thank you. We do have a second there for the motion. Statement from Councillor Amos, given the situation up at, uh, up at Pant, but what I'm very, very concerned about as a person who lives in Pant, and uh, not far actually from the cemetery, but what, what we want as well is for people to have peace and quiet. And um, when people's family are buried in Pant Cemetery, I, I've none myself and Kevin Coyd, but my wife and other people I know in the, in the community, they want peace and quiet in the cemeteries and now they're not having it. They're not content, they're not happy because things are going on. When those gates were shut, they felt better. It's like your own home. When you close your door in the night and put the locker on, whatever, you feel happier. So I, I'm not going to add anything to the council, because that's, uh, that's a good, concise report. But what I'm concerned about is the people that are feeling there where their loved ones <coughs> buried in Pan Cemetery, and they want contentment and, and quiet. When they want to go there, they can go there, but not, not be interrupted in the evening by cars or lumping or dumping or whatever because it is going on so i second councillor amos 
that we do. We must get the locks back on Pan Cemetery. Thank you. So if I can just be clear for Council, there is now an amendment to the recommendation which has been moved and seconded. So what you do is you deal with the amendment first of all. You can ask any questions that you have uh, and you can make any comments and then we'll take a vote on the amendment. If the amendment is carried, then that is the resolution of the Council on, in respect of this matter. If it falls, then we'll go back to the original resolution and you will conclude your debate on the original resolution and you will vote on that. So, uh, Mr Mayor, it's over to the floor for questions. So, do we have any questions on Councillor Amos's amendment? Councillor Skinner. Yeah, I just wonder whether you mentioned about the petition, Councillor Amos, and the two to 300 people. Um, given times of austerity and the budget cuts, do the people, the two or 300 people, realise the consequences of their choice or, dis or their, um, what they would like? Um, so f if they were to get what they wanted, are, are they fully understanding that that might be the co at a cost of other services going. Well, the short answer, um, Councillor Skinner, is yes, because we have uh, made it perfectly clear that everything costs money, and that uh, if we go back to this, something uh, something we'll give elsewhere. Uh, obviously, we haven't said what, uh, but not, uh, I think, well, I know people are clear that everything comes at a price. But as far as they're concerned, it's a price certainly worth paying. Can I I think Councillor Amos has answered that question sufficiently. Thank you, Mr. Councillor Amos. Do we have any further questions on the amendment? Can I just then give, so, sorry, did you want to answer? Uh, j just for clarity, really, uh, are we saying then, Councillor Amos, that we don't want any form of consultation within this amendment? Uh, absolutely, um, because as I said in the, um, in the speech I gave in support of the, the uh, amendment, uh, the only people who will suffer detriment, which is the basis for making a consultation, is the people who are going up there under cover of darkness. Uh, people who are legitimately using the, ce the cemetery for what it was intended for, tending graves, uh, putting flowers on and so on, funerals, uh, they will suffer no detriment because uh, the gates will be open at a convenient time for all whether it's nine o'clock till five, I'm, I'm quite easy with the actual times, but uh, they will suffer no detriment at all. It'll, the only people who will suffer detriment is uh, the people who uh, are there for nefarious purposes. So therefore, uh, I see no reason to consult them. If, if, if somebody thinks there's a reason to consult people who are basically criminals, well then, <coughs> so be it. If, if there are no further questions, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as a councillor of the of the Dallas Ward, where Pan Cemetery is um, situated, I've always wanted, and I want them clo the, the cemetery shut, and I want them uh, closed as soon as possible, but not at the cost of other services. And I think this should go out to consultation to the local residents and let them have their say. We did have a an SLA agree that would cost nothing um, and I'd just like to give the residents uh, a chance to, to do, do it themselves maybe. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. I just wondered uh, Councillor Amos if um, you would you talk you mentioned again about your ward and, and specifically the <coughs> sorry the Pan Cemetery um, but this is a borough-wide issue and it, it with, with the borough-wide consequences, so I wonder what your thoughts are on that, really. And it's fine. I, I understand you're representing 
a set of people, but it is a borough-wide consequence as well. So I just wondered what your response was. Well, well, I can't speak for any problems they're having down in the other four cemeteries. Obviously, I, that's a matter for the other ward councillors. Um, my primary concern is uh, responding to the representations we have had. Uh, when the last election, when we were, before we put anything out, we were told one of the questions you're going to be asked is about the Pant Cemetery and what you're going to do about it. Now, to answer your question, obviously, Everything might be hunky dory down in the other four cemeteries. I do, I do not know. It's probably a good call, yeah. Um, but we certainly are hunky dory uh, up in Pant. Councillor Skinner. Would you agree, therefore, that that's why consultation is necessary to find out what the other residents in the other areas think? Just on, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Skinner. Can I answer that? Um, for a start, um, even though we're well in the situation we're in as a local authority, the amount of money we receive, you can't put money on bereavement. Bereavement is above that. When people are buried, they need to be buried and kept in peace. That's what we want to remember. And the big important point of this, no one was consulted before it happened. Now there's a big rush to consult. Why didn't they consult before? And if democratically, they decided, and the people and the public meetings or whatever decided, so be it. I'm a Democrat. I believe in that. I believe in democracy. I would have accepted it. But no one was ever consulted. And don't forget, a very big petition came in this, in this uh, council. I don't know where it's gone, mine. But it came in from the people and the residents of Panton Dowlais. Mr. Mayor, obviously, uh, this is a quorum limited subject, uh, which we're, we're currently dealing with, but there's a couple of things. Uh, in regards to the petition, um, and we will need to check whether this council ever received the petition in regards to this, uh, this cemetery, and I suggest as part of this process, uh, we will deal with that, because all, all petitions that come into this authority uh, are notified to council uh, uh, on the agenda. So. So that will need to be dealt with, and obviously the officers uh, would have reported back. Second point I want to make is that, uh, just picking up what Councillor Salmon said, uh, this council's got a policy and adopted a, an operating model uh, last year in regards to ensuring that citizens uh, do a lot more for themselves. Uh, and clearly uh, that uh, position was brought in by the previous administration, given the austerity we find ourselves in. And I think, you know, working on that basis, I know that the current administrations uh, has certainly got lots of people uh, engaged and uh, motivated in regards to grass cutting, et cetera, et cetera, which is exactly what we need because uh, as our money shrinks, then our services uh, shrink quite clearly. I think uh, the issue which is quite rightly made in regards to, um, you know, only legitimate users using uh, the cemeteries I think uh, if we look at paragraph 3.8, and I fully endorse what, uh, uh, engage with what Councillor Amos says, but as a result of the uh, social media uh, exercise that, that happened here, is that there is a mixed view on social media. So there are people out there who are actually saying, actually, uh, we don't want the gate shut at all. Um, and uh, whilst we say about legitimate users, again, I think we need to, we can only act on evidence, and I, you know, Councillor Amos must be fully aware of this. You know, the police system uh, raises no issues uh, about niche, uh, on the niche system in regards to thefts or things like that, no antisocial behaviour. But again, lots of people don't report these issues uh, because, you know, of the, uh, the response. So I think we've got a position whereby uh, we've got, uh, you know, a bit of a dichotomy because on social media there's an issue being raised currently that there is uh, there's a there's a, a, a body of individuals out there who wish to uh, raise uh, an issue uh, I think the issue is is that we're trying to engage with public to to do lots of things that the council used to do because of austerity and if there was an SLA to do this at no cost to the council then again that's something that may come out of the consultation exercise uh, picking up the point in regards to uh, Councillor Amos's amendment, um, I don't think you could, you, whilst you can approve the amendment, 
Uh, there's no financial implications adopted with that because the issue you've got is, is that the proposal that's being made has got no financial contribution from this authority because it was removed previously, so the £75,000. Uh, and again, we have to look across the county borough, as Councillor Skinner says, because we've got an equalities issue here as well. You can't do it in one cemetery and not the other four, so there's an issue there. We don't have the funding, so <laughs> therefore we'd have to uh, locate the funding. Uh, and um, I'm sure Caris will come on to it and she can give you better advice than I am sure. If there is a potential of a judicial review in regards to this, and again, there is a legitimate ex expectation that we consult because things have moved on in the last five, six years in regards to, uh, th there's case law in regards to libraries, closing the libraries, removing facilities, changing hours of library opening, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, is that the public expect now a, a, a listening engagement and a consultation exercise? Um, so. If we do adopt the uh, amendment, uh, then uh, I would suggest we don't implement it for at least six weeks, which allows for the judicial review period to, uh, to, to, to lapse, um, given that if we did go out, and we will have to go out to uh, procurement for this because the service wasn't uh, provided previously by our own staff, it was contracted uh, in and it cost us £75,000. If we go out to contract it in and we're judicially reviewed and we let, let a contract then we're in for the damages that that may cause. So I think uh, whilst I engage fully with Council Amos, if, if the uh, Council's view is that you accept the amendment, I would respectfully suggest that Council Amos changes it to say that a further report in regards to what uh, you agreed to be brought back to Council in October so that we can deal with all the issues, the finances issues, uh, the, uh, the judicial view or possible uh, and, uh, and how we go with that, because we're in a situation where there's no money in the budget to deal with this at the moment. So um, perhaps just before Councillor um, Amos and Councillor Rogers come back in, if I can just confirm the position with regard to legal advice in respect of this matter. I've listened to what Councillor Amos and Councillor Rogers have said, and they, they clearly hold um, very well balanced views which they, they've considered and expressed to you very carefully this evening. However, I refer to the legal advice that you've been provided in the report uh, and I have not heard anything that would cause me to change that legal advice to you. So the legal advice to you remains uh, that there needs to be consultation. With regard to the point that's been made uh, about there not having been consultation about making a decision to move in the other direction. That's dealt with at paragraph 3.2 in the report uh, and there was no detrimental impact at that point, so therefore no need uh, for there to have been a consultation at that point. What we know from views that are already being expressed is that there are differing views. It isn't a situation where everybody thinks the same thing and that is what gives rise to the need for, for consultation. You are in a position where there will be people who have differing views, we know that already, and that is part of what gives rise to the need for consultation. Um, just to reiterate something that Gareth has already said, um, there is a risk. You need to consider the risk. So it's not just the risk that you know, which is that you will already be incurring a cost which you know that you don't have a budget to fulfil, and that is the cost uh, of, uh, of staffing the operation that would then have to come into place. Uh, but you will also have the risk that you may face legal challenge if you are judicially reviewed, you are not normally in a position to recover your costs of judicially reviewing uh, a local authority. So if you are judicially reviewed, even if you were to succeed at that judicial review, you would likely have to pay the costs of that judicial review. So therefore, I come to a conclusion where I remind you under the Code of Conduct of the requirement that you have due reg regard to the advice of the monitoring officer and tell you that my advice remains as is set out in the report which is that the legal requirement is that you consult. Could, could I just ask Caris, and it comes from you, you, you very good point you made there about ju uh, judicial review, is the point Gareth made earlier was that uh, if we were to uh, avoid uh, judicial review, we would have to uh, refrain from implementing any decision uh, till the uh, the actual the there's the expiry date for uh, the judicial review to be made. So I think if that was done, would your advice remain the same? 
it's two slightly different points. If you made the decision today that you were not going to go out to consultation, but you're going to delay, that is on the basis that you would wait to see whether a judicial review was launched. If it is launched, you still have to pay the costs, <coughs> even if you then withdraw and change your view. So getting to the point of making a decision which is judicially reviewable or reviewed costs you money. So if you make that decision today, even if you delay, you may delay for the six weeks for the implementation, but if a judicial review comes in, you may still be incurring costs. If you decide today to go out to consultation, then you don't have the issue of potentially being judicially reviewed. Does that make sense? To pick up the, the, the other point, sorry. Uh, the other legal point is, if we did get a judicial review, uh, it's unlikely that it would be heard within 12 months. So that holds the decision for 12 months, so we wouldn't be able to do anything anyway. And the other view is, is that I'm sure Karis and I would be, or certainly Karis is a lawyer, not me, uh, would be advising that we wouldn't let any contract in any event because we're at risk then uh, of, uh, you know, cost. So we, we would, you know, it would be ultra various for us to advise you as a council to expend money on something which actually could be unlawful. Leader. Yeah. Um, our approach throughout this has been open and transparent. I'm disappointed in some of the comments made by Councillor Amos in the sense that a considerable industry has gone into this, particularly by Ellis and his team, a considerable amount of work, and we've worked hard to expedite this matter. Um, I can speak personally. I have got family in Pant Pembrokeshire. So I suppose, everybody, this is not an issue for one area. We are all councillors of Merthyr Tidville County Borough Council. And I see that clearly in the short time I'm a councillor. It's the ward that comes after. So the strategic perspective must be taken in. And there's a wider position here, and I, I, I echo Councillor Skinner's issues about the wider cost. Everything has a cost, even bereavement. And it has to be done properly and above board. This, some of the information has only come to light today. It's only come to light today, which is concerns me because of the amount of work we could have done in relation to some of the information that's come to light today. And I feel it's only right and proper. I would never judge people's views based on a belief. We should go out and ask and speak and not assume. That's where we've gone wrong in the past. We should never assume what the public think. We should always ask and find to be sure. Right, Are there any other comments? If I can just be clear, what you're now doing is voting on the amendment. So you are voting on the amendment that Councillor Amos has put forward, supported by uh, Councillor Rogers, uh, and that was uh, in effect that, that you, you don't go out to consultation and that you proceed to go ahead and approve. Um, please. That may be helpful, Councillor Amos, if you wanted to read it out again, rather than me trying to paraphrase it. It was to uh, delete the existing paragraph 310 and add a new paragraph 310. Uh, Councillor rec Council recognises that law-abiding daylight visitors to the cemeteries will not suffer detriment as a result of the proposal and therefore consultation with the public is unnecessary. Council instructs officers to take the necessary steps of locking the gates of all cemetery gates in the county borough forthwith. Okay, can we take a vote on that amendment then please? So the amendment falls, so we now need to proceed to deal with the original recommendation uh, and to proceed to take a vote in respect of the original recommendation as set out uh, at page 143, paragraph 2.1, which has already been moved and seconded.
Right, can we put that uh, to the vote then, please? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, that's carried. And we now move on to agenda item number 13. This is the CCTV policy to consider the report of the Deputy Chief Executive on pages 147 to 160 and Councillor Andrew Barry. Never been so pleased to see a CCTV policy, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some of the report. Uh, Council uses closed circuit CCTV systems uh, in public spaces. Uh, the CCTV policy, along with the uh, I, I see all, uh, CCTV code of practice, designed to give clear guidelines on the council's use of CCTV and to protect the council and CCTV operation uh, operators uh, from al allegations of misuse of the system and to protect staff uh, and the public from any abuse to the CCTV system. Uh, the policy covers the use of the CCTV, gathering storage of the information, disposal of visual data. Uh, policy applies to all staff employed by the council. Uh, standards expected from any external agencies and persons who operate the CCTV system on its behalf. We'll come back to the recommendations of 2.1, uh, 3.1 to 3.8, cover the introduction and background including why and what the cameras will be used for. Uh, 3.2, you can see uh, why it's there. 3.3, authorization of use. Uh, 3.4 to 3.5, what will, what it will and will not be used for, and how we process, store, and access the information. Uh, at 3.7, you'll see full council has previously agreed that the information security policy and the supporting operational policies can be kept up to date, amended, deleted, and relevant provisions added or substituted as necessary by the Information Governance Forum in consultation with Cabinet Member uh, for Governance Corporate Services. Me. Uh, the Information Governance Forum would like to request the same principle is applied to the CCTV policy. The following statement can be found. It's there at 3.7. Uh, in the event of any update, to the CCTV policy, the Information Governance Forum will provide full council with uh, an information report uh, in relation to the update. There are no financial implications. I'll take you back to the recommendations at 2.1 that the CCTV policy be approved uh, and the Information Governance Forum be authorized to update and amend the policy as necessary. I move, Chair. Second. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments? Oh, can we put that to the vote then, please? Thank you, that vote's carried. And we now move on to agenda item number 14. It's the Employee Protection Register Policy to consider the report of the Deputy Chief Executive of pages 161 to 174, Councillor Andrew Barry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the Employee Protection Register policy is to provide managers and staff with information about people from the council, uh, whom the council, sorry, believes may present a credible and ongoing risk uh, to the health and safety of the council employees. That does cover councillors as well, I'm told. Um, the uh, register outlines, uh, the policy, sorry, outlines the processes for adding people to the EPR, uh, where a member of the council staff has been subject to violence, potential violence or harm, uh, not a mechanism for attributing blame. Uh, it's a process for alerting staff to the possibility of violence and harm. Uh, we'll come back to 2.1, the recommendation. 3.1 to 3.10 uh, give examples of people that may be included. Uh, legal obligations are covered at 3.2 to 3.4. Practicalities of having the register then are covered in 3.5 to 3.8. Uh, and as before, 
Uh, the full council has previously agreed the information security policy uh, and supporting operational policies can be kept up to date, amended, deleted, uh, and relevant provisions uh, added or substituted as necessary by the Information Governance Forum in consultation with the Cabinet Member for Governance Corporate Services. The Information Governance Forum would like to request the same principle be added to, and as an amendment to the paragraph there, it should read EPR rather than CCTV policy. The following statement can be found within, and again, there's a, a, an amendment to CCTV, it should read EPR policy, and the statement can be found there at 3.9. Uh, 3.10, in the event of any update uh, to the EPR policy, the Information Governance Forum will provide full council with an information report in relation to the update. There are no financial implications here, Chair. Uh, and I'll take you back to the recommendations of 2.1. Uh, the Employee Protection Register policy to be approved and the Information Governance Forum be authorised to update and amend the policy as necessary. I move, Chair. I second. Thank you. Do we have any questions? No. Any comments? No? And we put that to the vote then, please. That vote's carried, thank you very much. And we move on now to agenda item 15. Inven inven <laughs> my teeth back in. Environmental cleansing and enforcement, littering and dog fouling policy. To consider report of the Chief Officer Neighbourhood Services, pages 175 to 186, and Councillor Howard Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, this is a environmental cleansing and enforcement litter and dog fouling policy. Um, a summary report, the Council approved the environmental cleansing and enforcement littering and dog fouling policy that was put forward in March 2017. This report outlines an amendment to the policy that allows alleged offenders a discounted early payment of 50%. Um, it's a quite an intense report. Uh, I think there's been many questions on this. Um, and I removed the, uh, uh, removed the recommendations to submit the questions and comments. Uh, recommendation of 2.1 amendment made to the environment that cleans in and enforcement littering and dog funding policy relating to an early discounted payment is approved. I'd like to add a 2.2 .2 to that, if I may. That, um, that a report be brought back to council after a six month period on the update of the uh, policy. A second. Thank you, do you have any questions? Can you put your mic on, please, Bill? 50% discount with other lo local authorities are getting stronger and harder on fines. Now, when RTT had just got fines out that dog walkers don't carry used dogs in, uh, dog bags, I think they're fine. So, this is one of the biggest issues that in my ward, and by the way, dog fouling. So, why are we changing the policy? Yeah, thank you. Well, through the consultation process, which we've had with many of the uh, meetings that we've had, uh, we felt that the same opportunity should be given to payment of the fines, the same opportunity as somebody has a parking ticket, which is presently in, in the council. So we felt that's an opportunity and give a resident a chance of paying the fine earlier at a discounted price. I don't know nothing about the consultation then on this dog fouling. How would you want to take that? Which, which, which consultation? Uh, Shirley, please. Okay. Mm. I think um, Councillor Barrett is referring to the consultations, internal consultations between staff and, and members. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, but it's a bit naughty. We were talking about consultation on Rocky Assembly Gate. We were talking about consultation on the last issue. And then we bring this internal consultation where the people are there are more concerned about the mess and the payments on the road. Councillor Barrett. 
Uh, Bill, I got to apologize. I did read you say the wrong phrase. It was because uh, um, it wasn't a consultation. It was a meeting of the VI on this on this uh, report that we were carrying. I will sorry apologize for that. I'm sorry. It wasn't a consultation. Councillor Scott Thomas. Oh, sorry. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in respect to the fines, uh, is the £85 fixed penalty for littering the maximum amount we could impose? Um, what level of the penalties do our neighbouring authorities actually impose, and do they allow the early settlements in respect of that? Oh yeah. Um, in terms of uh, the £85, uh, no, it isn't the maximum. Uh, it can go up to £125. Um, and other authorities vary uh, between uh, Leaf Port Talbot is under £100, Blaine and Gwent is under £125, Torvine is under £100, Cardiff is £80, RCP £75, Caerphilly £75 and Swansea £75. Sorry, uh, early payments as well, yeah, they're on offer in Leaf Port Talbot where it goes from £100 to £75, paid within 7 to 10 working days. And Blaine and Gwent from 125 to 100 within seven to ten working days, and Swansea is 75 to 50 pound. Leader, leader, want to ask a question? I just want to refer back to the the report and to remind that this was a a policy that was brought in with the previous um, administration. What we were looking at today was the particular amendment. Uh, we have done some considerable work on this and looking into uh, a softer approach, an educational approach, where people would know what was expected, that people would know what was coming. We've spoken to local businesses about how much rubbish they deploy. We've spoken to people out in parks about the issue as far as dog fouling. And we've actually had the staff out there working already, going out there doing educational. We are not looking to uh, recoup money. This isn't the principal year. It's about cleaning up our environment. And we felt it was fair, open and transparent to have that ability to have a reduced fine when someone uh, accepted responsibility early. It's well known and tested across many enforcement areas. I hasten to add that we've picked this up and tried to shape it into much more user friendly and uh, public friendly. And the public are very aware of what went before with the other methods and we've tried to turn that as a head. And there's been a lot of communication and consultation from us with our people out there in relation to this matter. And I'm sure many of the other Labour uh, councillors and independent councillors have spoken to their public about it. And we're all pretty aware of the problem remains the same. It's of people depositing litter out no thought for anybody else. This is a minority, and we're looking to support the majority who actually comply with the law and don't do it. And that's why we've adopted this different approach. This is learning from what's happened before with the other enforcement issues and looking to make it fairer better and more reasonable. Uh, thank you. I think we're going to have to move on to comments now because the leader seconded that, mo uh, that motion. Um, final comments. You've, cl you've closed the questions on that, so it's just comments only now, please. Councillor Barry. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, I was going to say that uh, this was going to be tonight's, uh, probably, probably tonight's only bone of contention. Well, I got that badly wrong, didn't I? I, I think it's worth saying, Ms. Mayor, that, that it's pleasing that it's such broad reach and accord on the majority of the policy because we, we all want to get rid of the environmental problems that we got. However, the Labour Group sees no benefit in offering a discount to those who deliberately litter, because only people who deliberately litter will get the notice, or who leave the dog waste in situ. People do that deliberately. We don't think they should be offered a discount for that. And such a discount will do nothing to address the environmental blight that's damaging our, our county better. So the Labour Group will be voting against this recommendation. Comes to Skinner. It was just to say that uh, as a borough that feature heavily in the Welsh Multiple Index for Deprivation, is it really appropriate not to offer a discount? and to even consider putting the maximum amount of fines in place. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr Mayor. 
Whilst I'm pleased that there's going to be an introductory period before the warden's in force, I also feel that there's been such coverage in social media, the press, etc., that since February 2016, when the one-year trial was introduced, that this service, and it is a service to all the residents of the county borough that want a clean environment, will have been publicised adequately for people to know that should they deliberately litter in our county borough, that they face a substantial penalty. Much has already been done in the line of education on littering, and most red residents do not litter. It is only the thoughtless few that do. I believe that the only remaining avenue open to us is finding those, ir those irresponsible people who do not care about their environment. The penalty is intended to be a deterrent to those who deliberately litter and dogfowl, and I believe the level of penalty we choose is already one of the lowest in our neighbouring authorities. I didn't know, I didn't have the figures earlier, so I pretty much thrown out with that. Um, and many of the others do not offer reductions. Do not litter or allow your dog to foul our public areas and you won't be penalised. It's simple. For this reason, I'm against the early discount and hope that you will vote with me, us, on scrapping the early discount to send a strong message that we, as a council, do not condone littering or dog fouling in Norfolk Woodville. Thank you. Comes to Salmon. Thank you. Um, as the leader, Kevin O'Neill, said, um, we're going to look at this again in six months. Um, so we will take the public's views on board in scrutiny of neighbourhood services. And if anyone has any questions uh, in the meantime, during that six months, or any problems with, any, uh, with anything that has occurred, you, you can get in contact with uh, your local councillor or myself as the chair of uh, scrutiny of neighbourhood services. Bill? Thank you, Mr Mayor. With all these policies coming in, are we having more now changes on our cost-cutting fines? That's, that's what it seems like to me because we've got a PPO or Pexa, Pexa and order for drink and for antisocial coming in the 6th of April. So it's under pound fine, so it's no discount. So the, uh, the, uh, the opposition going to go forward and change that and have a, che a cheaper rate for them because it's a big issue. Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have to echo Councillor Barry and Councillor David, uh, Councillor Jones's point. Uh, I, from what, from the figures that were given down there uh, a few moments ago, it seems that this local authority is quite low enough as it is, and very generous with its uh, the, the fines it levies. So I see no pur uh, purpose in putting these uh, at a discount rate for people who uh, decide to drop litter in our county borough and allow their dogs to foul the place. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, as, as we all know, there are more uh, community groups being set up to pick litter up. Um, in the election, um, all members would have knocked on doors and would have had the complaint about litter and fly tipping and dog mess. If having uh, a deterrent uh, helps, with the amount of litter on the streets, then I think uh, a deterrent is the way forward. Obviously, litter breeds rats as well, so there's a, there's a, a bigger environmental uh, issue here than just a bit of litter and fines. So, like um, uh, Chris Barry said, um, we will be voting against it. Thank you. Carlos Lewis. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Given the severity of, of the issue in respect of do dog fouling, a, a fine in my opinion, doesn't go far enough. There are other uh, measures that can be imposed, um, such as the prohibition of dog fouling in, in all public places. Um, and that's somewhere I'd, I'd like the council to proceed on in future. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Richards. Obviously, I'd like to echo uh, what has been said by uh, many of the members here tonight. Certainly during the election period, it is one of the biggest issues that uh, was arising uh, from residents was the level of littering about the place and the level of uh, dog fouling. Uh, I would like to uh, also um, support what Gareth has said, that the council should be looking towards stronger measures um, going along um, the road, which obviously you may have seen in the press that RCT are going, uh, stronger measures to enforce uh, what was to me the biggest issue within my ward 
um, during the election period. And um, obviously, we consult with our public. Uh, we consult, uh, we're quite close to the Berlin Award. Uh, it's an issue that still arises by residents from the Berlin Award contacting me, and I would hope they would support us in um, not voting for this reduction in the, in the fine. Clive? Um, this, frankly, is a major issue, and if we accept the recommendation here, it will do absolutely nothing. It will send the wrong signal to those offenders and those uh, th there are the, an element of those fem offenders have had a fine in the past. Many others get away with it. So uh, as far as I'm concerned and this group is concerned, this is definitely the wrong message. We've tried over a number of years to go down the education route. And yes, that must go along with enforcement. But you just can't re rely on the number one issue of trying to educate a small number of the public. Councillor Isaac? Yeah, um, I'd like to comment on the report itself. Um, it says in it that if an FPN isn't paid within 14 days, the offender does not get a criminal record. But isn't, isn't uh, not giving your name to a warden a criminal offence anyway? So this report may be misleading people in different ways. I, th I think everybody needs to be clear that we're now in comments, and we're in comments on the issue that is contained in the report. So we are definitely now beginning to stray back into questions and into issues about other matters that could be proposed. So you are solely dealing with whether or not you are going to agree or not agree with the proposal for this discount scheme. I'm sorry, not something you've already spoken previously. <laughs> Okay, um, and final comments from the leader, please. Yeah, could I have a recorded vote, please? The process for a recorded vote is that there would need to be five people supporting that request. So are there five members supporting the request for a recorded vote? Show of hands, please. Yes, that's fine. Then we'll do a recorded vote. So, if I can remind members, therefore, that you are voting with regard to the recommendations on page 175, the first being the uh, amendment made to the environmental cleansing and enforcement littering and dog fouling policy relating to early discounted payment is approved, and secondly, that a report to Council after six months uh, will be produced uh, to update on that policy. So, can I ask for votes as to whether you are for or against that motion. Uh, the first being Councillor Julian Amos. Against. Councillor Howard Barrett. Councillor Andrew Barry. Councillor Chris Barry. Councillor Rhonda Braithwaite. Councillor Paul Brown. Councillor Brent Carter. Councillor David Chaplin. Yes. Councillor Malcolm Colbran. Yes. Councillor Chris Davis. Yes. Councillor Lee Davis. Yes. Councillor Ernie Goldsworthy. Yes. Councillor Kevin, Kevin Gibbs. Oh. Councillor David Hughes. Yes. Councillor David Isaac. Yes. Councillor Cheryl Jago. Yes. Councillor Clive Jones. Yes. Councillor David Jones. Councillor Harvey Jones. Councillor Gareth Lewis. Yes. It's missing Councillor Kevin O'Neill. Yes. Councillor Gareth Richards. Yes. Councillor Darren Roberts. Yes. Councillor Tony Rogers. Yes. Councillor Declan Salmon. Yes. Councillor Tanya Skinner. Yes. Councillor Bill Smith. Yes. Councillor Geraint Thomas. Councillor Ian Thomas. 
missing Councillor Scott Thomas and Councillor Clive Tibbon. There are 14 votes for the motion and 17 votes against the motion, and so the motion falls. Okay, the next item on the agenda is agenda item number 16. Right, Julian. <laughs> Chair, um, it's the authorization of officers and the le of legislation affecting the administration of licensing requirements for hackney carriage drivers and vehicles, private hire operators, drivers and vehicles. Um, the summary of the report is set out from 1.1 through to 1.5. Um, and the point 4.1 financial implications, any costs can be absorbed within the current budget for the licensing service. And the recommendations are set out in items 2.1 to items 2.4. I'd like to move that, please. I'd like to second that. Have we got any questions? Any comments? No? And if you can take that to the vote then, please. Our votes carry. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The, uh, the next couple of items are information reports only. Number 17 is the remuneration paid to members 2016-2017 to receive the report of the Chief Executive, and that's on pages 191 to 198. That's then followed by... There's a correction to be made. It's part of it being corrected. Councillor Jones. On page um, 194, the bottom of the page, it's got under the council's name, Councillor McCarthy, but in the previous administration, Chair of Scrutiny, that is incorrect. Thank you, that's noted. So we're on uh, agenda item number 18. It's an information report only again. Petitions received by the authority to receive report of the Chief Executive. That's pages 199 to 200. Uh, agenda item number 19 is the Memorandum of Understanding, South Wales Police, Doorstep Crime and Rogue Trading. That's mm -hmm. Again, to receive the report of the Chief Officer Community Regeneration, pages two, 201 to 202. We have the annual agenda item number 20. We have the annual report on social services, 2016-2017, to receive the report of the Chief Officer Social Services. And that's on pages two, 203 to 236. And agenda item number 21 is Comtaf medication policy for domiciliary care services to receive the report of the Chief Officer of Social Services, and that's pages 237 to 240. Okay. And the next session is going to be an exempt session. Can I ask somebody to move section 100, please? I'll move section 100. Second. Seconded? Second. Lovely. Thank you. All in favour? Put it to the vote, please. Section 100. That's carried. Thank you.
So, we, so we're back in the reopen session now. Um, item number 24, other items to deal with any other urgent business or correspondence, I have none. Um, item number 25, to receive communications from His Worship the Mayor, I have none. Thank you very much. Me meeting over.